Namaskar. Welcome to the Bihar Museum Biennale. This is our final session on the two-day international conference on Bihar, India, and the world. The title of this panel also reflects the curatorial framework of the entire conference. So it becomes even more dynamic and significant for all of us, particularly here in Bihar and in India. I'm really delighted to have such a eclectic, uh, interesting, and a very dynamic panel which has been really put together by my very, very dear friend, Sarat Chandra Maharaj. Thank you so much, Sarat, for putting together this delightful panel. And I'm sure as we go along, after we've had a little discussion with each other, some very interesting thoughts will emerge. I would begin by introducing each of the panelists and then ask them to give a little presentation between five to seven minutes, and then we can all go into a discussion. There were certain questions which uh, were in my head when I thought of Bihar, India, and the world, and museums. With the whole uh, uh, concept of the museum changing from an ajayab ghar, this is a Hindi word which means a wonder house, to the more dynamic experiential museum, which is today the Bihar Museum. It has an interesting mix of objects from the famed Didar Ganjakshi, which is from the third century of the common era, before the common era, to the diaspora gallery, which is still being uh, prepared and is, is really a work in progress, to a children's gallery, which is extremely experiential, the Bihar Museum itself is a site of production of great ideas, and this is what this panel is also going to be a part of. Um, I'm going to begin by introducing in an alphabetical order the panelists. We have Clifford Charles, a, an artist who spent his formative years in the liberation struggle of South Africa. While studying fine arts at the University of Waterstrand, he was part of a radical black group who later became the Africa Cultural Center, which subsequently became the foremost political arts research collective. Clifford has participated in writer's residency at the Rockefeller Foundation, Italy, a mini retrospective at Pallant House, Modern British Art Museum, UK, the Nerox Foundation, South Africa, and closer home to the Kochi Mujeris Biennale. There are many more things about Clifford, but that everybody or all of you who want to know more can go to our website, which is Bihar Museum Biennale 2021.org and you can get more information. Then we have David Dabidin, a Guyanese born novelist, poet and academic. He was formerly Guyana's ambassador to UNESCO and was appointed Guyana's ambassador to China from 2010 to 2015. He's one of the longest serving diplomats in the history of Guyana, and most of his work has been done in a voluntary capacity. He's currently director of the Amina Ghafoor Institute for the study of indentureship and its legacies in London. And then we have Francoise Verges, who is from the Reunion Island, curator, lecturer, and writer. Francoise has written on cultures and migrations of the Indian Ocean worlds and worked on the scientific and cultural programming for a museum in Reunion Island that took the temporalities and spatialities of the circulations in the Indian Ocean as its starting point. She is co-founder of the collective Decolonize the Arts 2015 France and has been a professor of cultural studies, Goldsmiths London, chair of Global South at FMSH Paris and visiting professor in universe, US universities. 
Francoise has written on the decolonization of museums, decolonial feminist theory, colonial slavery, European colonization and resistance to colonialism. And my friend Sarat Chandra Maharaj, who is from South Africa and the United Kingdom, a professor of visual art and knowledge systems, Lund University, Sweden, and research professor, Goldsmiths University of London, where he was professor of art history and theory. His specialist research and publications focus on Marcel Duchamp, James Joyce, and Richard Hamilton. His writing covers monkey doodle, thinking through art practice, visual art as know-how and know-how, textile xenosonics and xenoepistemics, thinking the other and other ways of thinking, cultural translation, dirty cosmopolitanism, north-south divisions of work, manufacture and creative labor. There's lots more to each of the resource people, but as I said, I'd rather save the time for our discussions and for all of you who want to know more, do go to our website. I'm going to request David to literally kick off the panel and then the others will continue. So David, over to you. Thank you, Alka. And um, let me say that um, special thanks to Sarat, whom I've not seen for 20 years. Sarat, we should have a whole session on your work <coughs> these days. Um, I, I'm here representing the Amina Gafur Institute, which is recently set up and one of the few institutions um, specializing in the study of indentorship and its legacies. And one of the things that I'm interested in is shifting the narrative from suffering and misery, which I acknowledge was part, was at the heart of indentorship, shifting it to to, um, to, to one of creativity and, 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 if I may say, success. Because after all, for example, my country, Guyana, is now on the brink of becoming the richest country on earth per capita. We discovered masses and masses, unfortunately, of oil. Yes. Suriname next door to us, Trinidad next door to us. We are very wealthy countries compared to India, you know. So, so this, the narrative really is one of success and, and improvement, and I would I would argue that one of the great, one of the one of the two of the positives of indentorship. We know the negatives. We know the oppression. We know the the colonization of the mind. We know all of that. But what happened to us when we lined up in the depot, in the sub depots, in the depots before we joined the ship? What happened to us was twofold. First of all, we lost caste. Amars and Brahmins, it doesn't matter. You had to queue up at the sub depot for your food like everybody else. There was a division. There were two lines, one for women, one for men. Whether you were Muslim or Hindu, it did not matter. You were all now coolies, workers, subject to the, to the dictates of the British. But what happened in the depots and on board the ship is that we lost everything. And not everything, we lost caste and we lost religion. And I want to put this beautiful line by um, Sudesh Mishra, the poet, who says, um, quote, many things were lost during that nautical voyage, family, caste, religion, and yet many things were also found. Chamars found Brahmins. Muslims found Hindus. Biharis found Marathis. So by the end of the voyage, we were a nation of Jahiji Bais. Now that sounds romantic, but it's absolutely true. As I said to you, Diana is now on the brink of becoming the richest country on earth. We only came out of indentureship in 1920. So, so, so I think we have to celebrate, whilst we lament, or remember, not lament, why should we remember what we lost um, and what we retained? Why, why, whilst we celebrate what we retained, let us also celebrate with fireworks what we lost, which is the pernicious, nasty aspect of caste. 
and religious animosity, which still prevails in our homes in India today. Um, so that's all I wanted to say, really. Um, final thing I should say to move it from the misery narrative. Did you know, that for the first time, those, those immigrants, those um, pulleys, those indentured laborers ate food in quantity. We know from the scholarship of um, Ashutosh Kumar, who I think teaches now at the University of Benares, we know from his scholarship, and I'll quote, I'll quote, um, I'll quote him, yes. Um, quote, when a person showed up, showed a willingness to sign a contract of indenture, he or she was sent immediately to the nearest recruiter's sub depot. Recruiters were then served, recruits were then served as much food as they could eat, so as to put them in a good frame of mind and hint at what was in store in the colonies. Now, a lot of these people from Bihar and UP were fleeing from famine. We know that, the, the, the numbers peaked during famine. So in a sense, for the first time, maybe for weeks, they were eating properly. And of course, when they got on board the, the, um, the, the ships, there were, strict, um, there, were strict, there were strict rules about what you should feed. The, 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 the indentured laborers because um, the British didn't want to be accused of creating a new system of slavery. So there were actually dire charts. And we know, for example, using the work of uh, Dr. Kumar, that, um, that say, for example, on, on board the ship, um, mutton once a week. Hmm? Do people have mutton once a week in India today? I wonder. Um, six sheep or goats per 100 men. Hmm? One gallon of water per adult per day. Now, if you come from Bihar, which is suffering from drought, one gallon of, one gallon of water was something special, right? Uh, preserved milk for pregnant women and children. Um, salt, tobacco, and pan. Hmm? <laughs> salt fish, dal, turmeric, onions, garlic, chilies, preserved potatoes, flour, rice. These are the, 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 the lists that we actually, that Dr. Kumar actually, um, Takai. So we have to revise the way we look at, at indentorship. First of all, seeing the enormous success it became inadvertently, not because the British planned it for us, <laughs> you know, and at the same time, recognize what was lost uh, and, and, and what we, what we, um, what, how, we how, how the cane cutters, um, suffered in the plantation. Finally, let me say, you come from a little, tiny, unknown village in Bihar, as many of the migrants these, um, on the boats um, arrived in Guyana, from tiny villages, sometimes 300 people. And suddenly, you're catapulted into the system of globalization. You move from being a completely obscure and unknown Indian, minding a cow, if you were lucky enough, right? And then suddenly you were part of this global system of, um, of great significance, one of the biggest movements in the 19th century of people, connecting India to the Caribbean to Britain. Obviously, when you're a colleague cutting your cane, you don't think of yourself as having global status. <laughs> you're just thinking of the sun and, and, and how hot it is and the snakes in the plantation. But you were catapulted into a, a new global system. You suddenly move from being a, a unknown peasant, being somebody of historical significance. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much for your very uh, personal readings, particularly of indentured labor. And uh, as we all are aware, that there was a lot of endangered labor which went from Bihar and from Eastern UP and the countries that you named, uh, Trinidad, Tobago, the Caribbean, Suriname, uh, has still, I mean, the, the resonances of that and the living population of that uh, is still part of that great diaspora and movement. Um, I'm going to now jump to Francoise and uh, see what she has to say about Bihar, India, and the world. Well, thank you so much, and thank you really, you know, for inviting me to this uh, 
panel. Well, I'm not an historian of migration nor of India, but I have always been interested in challenging Western hegemonic narrative of discovery, civilizing mission, and um, integrating, you know, in my writing and research, the processes that migration produce, you know, what the cultural, social, and political processes. Growing up in Réunion, so this small island in the Indian Ocean that the French took over in the 17th century, I look at the world from the south of the Indian Ocean, in which Europe was in the periphery. It was, you know, an Indo-Oceanic world that connect Africa, the Arabic Gulf, and Asia, south and east. It is a world in which navigation and connection have created a sea land continuum that has been marginalized by imperialist and nationalist narrative. And this land sea continuum is very important for me because the Western narrative has, has imposed a land sea continuum, but which is dominated by military history and men on their boat. And, and as they raise, the philosophy of sea land continuum that exists, especially in the Indian Ocean, but also in the Pacific and elsewhere. So this connection that I, I want to make, you know, that instead of thinking about land versus, you know, the sea and two moment, even for BR, which is landlocked, this connection to the larger world is also not, it's also reconnecting with the past history of navigation and commerce through the Indian Ocean. So these, the kind of map, you know, the, the world of, you know, flows, the, the route of exchange and encounter that trace, you know, uh, processes of hybridity of what we call creolization also, you know, so how this world uh, appear deeply hybrid and creolized. So starting from that and putting aside totally the Western narrative and starting from this and from also this lengthy continuum, you know, so to decolonize and to denationalize also land-based narrative. And I understand, of course, anti-colonial uh, ideology where land-based, you know, you had to recover the land, to recover the nation and to build a nation state. And so therefore there was a forgetting of the sea and ocean, which has been, of course, especially the Indian Ocean, circulated for centuries before the European arrived, but also it's for us from the sea that European colonial power brought arrive and also were able to organize slave trade, slavery, commerce, colonial commerce. They imposed law on navigation, international law that they were, they say it was international. And even today we see how the sea is being colonized and privatized and militarized. So the, the idea of also reappropriating and decolonizing, making the, de, uh, the decolonial world that we see much larger, you know, with that. So decolonizing maritime history, not simply bring back the story of sailors, pilgrim and merchant or activists across the sea, but to do this for connection between land and water. And culturally and historian of the Indian Ocean have already shown that it's mapping by European, uh, you know, drew landlocked territories that colonialism supposedly opened to the world, to the larger world. And erasing century of encounter of actions that we see all through the eastern coast of Africa or the island of the Indian Ocean, India, and in the larger world, you know. And so this is for me, you know, how to demilitarize, decolonize, uh, you know, this domination of Indian oceanic technology of navigation that has been in your by European narrative, and also to bring in women in that history, which is you know, usually male dominated. And we do know since we have been speaking of indentured worker that they were women who, who came. And uh, from Réunion Island, what we see, it's, it was a different history from men and women, but also the, what they brought with them, of course, was language, ritual, uh, taste, food, but also what there was an history in Réunion Island that uh, uh, women from the subcontinent of India brought the spice and they would sew the spice in the hem of their dresses. They hide them, you know, the seeds. So you find in the barrack where the indenture worker were put by the French colonial power, you find, for instance, uh, plants that are not vernacular and they are absolutely associated with Indian, uh, the subcontinent India. So 
it's to challenge this, uh, you know, uh, uh, hegemony narrative around the land sea and bring to light the intertwined history and overlapping territory, you know, that construct a dynamic history of borders, center and peripheries. So this is uh, for me even today, you know, to keep, you know, this uh, uh, mapping the Indo-Oceanic world of uh, the sea land uh, continuum. And, and to show this deep uh, hybrid world of friction and encounter, you know. So it's working in fact from almost the ocean and from the south to completely transform uh, the view. And this is for instance in, in the museum because you, you quoted, I mean, the when I work, we wanted to work from circulation rather than, you know, France there, and slave taken from Madagascar, and, and so level of that, and following in a way the colonial uh, chronology, and starting in fact from the Indian Ocean in which this circulation already occurred, and starting from there, transforming the temporality and the spatiality of our narratives. Thank you. Thank you, Francoise. And I think it's very interesting the way the whole uh, conversation has started. David begins by the journey, by the journey of indentured labor. And um, he talks about how we should revisit the entire journey. And here you are talking of the processes of migrations. So I think it's kind of moving in an interesting way. And now I'll come to Clifford to ask you, how do you uh, follow this kind of uh, trajectory. Yeah, thank you, first of all. Um, it's been a pleasure to share this platform with everyone. I decided to bring a little, I'll move it into the screen, just to get everyone to test this. And it's my little curry leaf tree, which I discovered had a little shoot that my mom, that I managed to get from Singapore. I've been keeping it during lockdown and nursing ring it in England with the cold. So today was the first day I opened it out of the, out of the winter hibernation, to discover a shoot. And so in a way it's, it's about that similar journey that Francois mentioned in terms of carrying and sowing seeds and the botanical interest is really interesting in terms of how it impacts with food and movement. And first and foremost, I'm an artist. And the older I get, the more dogmatic I want to sort of articulate that, that I am, a, uh, that I'm immersed in the anarchy of making, of creating. And sometimes it, it complicates my own experience. But at the same time, it's about challenging my lived experience, whether it's the cognitive dissidence of, you know, generations of trauma or just the idea of operating in a nonverbal world. And for me, I say that I, I work with water. Maybe to take David's uh, prompting, I've traveled over water. And so water is a very important medium. Uh, ink is part of the residue of the memory of water in my work. So as a South African, I had lived through the whole apartheid struggle, which in many ways was the continuum of the indentured struggle. And if anything, the apartheid struggle heightened the unfinished struggles of indenture. And today, in fact, last year, was the 160th anniversary of indenture in South Africa. Unfortunately, because it happened during the lockdown, it sort of uh, quietly slipped away. And I think we can go back to that in terms of why that's happening and what is the, um, the politics of remembering and forgetting. And yeah, so this is where I am tussling with in terms of how do we unveil this archive? How do we activize it? How do we put it back into a museum? And how do we create an open walled museum of memory? And so in South Africa, we are still struggling with the narrative of, of apartheid, just as we are struggling with the continuum of, in, of indenture. 
and more specifically, of course, with Ga uh, Gandhi's role in South Africa, which, which was such a pivotal, maybe filled with optimism, maybe mixed with the, the British Empire's uh, messiness of promises and disingenuousness. But at the same time, when he left South Africa, polishing the Satraga movement in South Africa to, to transport it back to India, there was an important link and a crucial link uh, that recognizes that South Africa became one of the largest populations of indentured people you know, uh, in, the, in the indentured world. And so I, I want to sort of play around, although I said earlier on that I'm very not, I'm much more comfortable in the nonverbal world. Um, I want to play around with two words, movement and movement, both the verb and the noun. And if we look at the etymology of the word, from Sanskrit, moved, it's moved by love, to surpass, to push away, to set action. And I can see immediately resonance to what David said in terms of what indentured meant and what it could mean. And at the same time, movement also talked about how we, we, we progress, how we carry stories. And South African Indians are still coming to terms with our indentured less history. The problem of that is that it's becoming much more convoluted, if not personalized, whether it's the Mandela story or whether it's uh, the Lutuli story or the Gandhi story. So there is a big movement now to specifically look at example women and the role of women in indentured. And so as, an, as a quick, just a little quick taster that I'll throw in, my, uh, my family that came from uh, Chennai, or one part of the family that came from Chennai, uh, stopped over in Mauritius. The, father, the great grandfather decided to abandon his wife in Mauritius. And so a, a young woman with her nephew was ended up working in Mauritius to a French family. And the story goes that the French family moved to South Africa and brought her along. As, and when she la landed in South Africa, she ended up having two children. One of course was my grandfather. So it just sort of complicates the issue in terms of how, how women and the role of women and that woman itself was, was a, took place in terms of a, a matriarchal position. It was not just simply driven sort of movement of men. And so, yeah, I think, let me just stop there for a minute and we can come back to uh, some of those stories. But, but maybe I should just, um, just point out that in the 1820s um, remembrance, my grandfather once said to me when I kept asking him about the indentured labor, he says, well, you know, we didn't really ask people because they, as soon as you got off the ship, they gave you another name. They gave you a name where they thought it was and they chose you this. And so it was an interesting journey in terms of how we South Africans re-map ourselves, re-try to draw the contours of who we are and how we fit ourselves in the global world. And more specifically as a practicist, what do I draw from the knowledge systems of India and the knowledge systems that, uh, that, that fuse into the global sphere? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Clifford. Thank you very much. You took us completely on a different journey, but very much connected to migrations and double migrations. And yeah. uh, the whole aspect yeah. of storytelling which you brought in is very close to our consciousness because India is mm. all about stories, legends, myths, and the whole narrative of mm. anything cult cultural uh, goes down to this whole aspect of yeah. a storytelling narrative. So thank you so much. 
for bringing in the curry leaf as well, which is also very much part of our food. Yeah. Thank you very much. And now, dearest Sarat, we are waiting to hear your views. You are closely connected to India, to uh, traditional knowledge systems of India, to Indian philosophy. Your aunt was a Swamini in India. You have roots in Eastern UP. And we are just waiting to understand uh, what is going on in your mind when we, we say Bihar, India, and the world with your deep love for India. Well, thank you very much, uh, Alka. And uh, thank you to all the contributors, David, Clifford, and Francois. Uh, such terrific material that we could spend the rest of the afternoon, as it is here in London, unpacking the concepts and ideas that you have presented. Thank you. I'm, I'm of course delighted that everyone sees that we are at a moment when there is a big paradigm shift to use that slightly hackneyed uh, term, but to use it in its more rigorous form that the uh, way of knowing what the experience of the indentured and the indentured diaspora meant uh, is shifting and is changing. The old story of the one-way ticket to oblivion, the one-way ticket to utter misery is, uh, is deeply questioned. Questioned in different ways and we're also beginning to see an internal differentiation in the types of indenture experience when we look at the Caribbean, we look at the Indian Ocean, we look at the Pacific indentureship in Fiji and then we compare it to the situation along the long African coast right down to South Africa because with the African coast we have a substantial presence with the indentured of a trading class of Indians. And that must give us some clue as to what the empire meant, that the empire meant the circulation of people. And it meant not just oblivion, but also opportunity. And, and that we tend to forget that the whole struggle of the indentured in South Africa, for example, was only triggered. Gandhi stopped being a brown Englishman only because invited by a trading uh, class Indian to fight a case for him in, in the courts in South Africa, a Muslim, the Kajis, invited by them, Gandhi begins to learn about the indentured and slowly begins to divest himself, changes even his clothes, his manner of speaking, the way people should address him. This transformation begins only in the encounter with the indentured. Prior to that, of course, he was very much an Englishman in, from University College and from the inns around the corner from where I live and simply um, a gentleman of, of that sort. So the idea of transformation and differentiations of the indenture experience is extremely important for us to bear in mind. To bring this into connection with the title, where the word, title of your whole event, Alka, which you have um, conceptualized, I, I, I think you've hidden that away, that this whole idea of a biennale in a museum, which seems to be one of the most shocking contradictions we could find in recent times, Museums are used by biennales, normally, by contemporary art biennales, but to have a whole biennale in the museum is um, demands an explanation and some sort of uh, elaboration. But that I will do in, in, in my, my talk, for which has yet to be recorded. Uh, for the moment, however, just to focus on the word connections, 
what connections and how are these connections to be imagined between Bihar and the world and of course what I, I would stress is the indentured diaspora. How are these to be imagined? We, we, can see, we can see that this requires scrutiny and has to come under some sort of spotlight because the connections are multiple and they are contradictory and we cannot make those sweeping generalizations about uh, the fact that, first of all, the indentured were the detritus of India in an impoverished state, and we just simply happily got rid of by packing them off to these far-flung places, as it was seen. By connection here, we, we need to capture some sort of new model of thinking what those relations amounted to. And I thought that comes across with this motif used by the event, by the Museum Biennale, uh, the, the image of, of the Didar Ganj, uh, Yakshi. Now I use the word Yakshi, meaning the, the kind of forest nymph or whatever might be the interpretation given to this figure. But for a long time, the figure was seen as a goddess figure, then it was interpreted as a, uh, a mother, uh, mother energy figure of the earth. And there are many readings given to this. And I think perhaps Kumaraswamy, the great art historian, uh, touched on, on the fact that there were a multiplicity of readings of this. We can't entirely be sure what this image meant? Is it the Shakti from Tantra? Is it feminine energy? Is it a goddess to be revered? What, what exactly is it? And I think that notion of a series of interpretations, all of which seem plausible up to a point, but simply are not congruent, do not fit each other, incommensurate to each other, is something we need to bear in mind in thinking about the experience of, uh, of indenture and, 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 and uh, the connections with India. If we just look at the word Bihar, what should it stand for? We can't just be so provincial as to say Bihar stands literally just for this province. Bihar stands for a catchment area, the hinterland of which goes to the Purbi or to um, Uttar Pradesh, beyond it to Uttarakhand. And of course, there we're already on the borders of the Punjab, Rajasthan. And if we move right to the east to Gujarat and across that spectrum, the nature of the indentured changes. When we get to Gujarat, we're seeing essentially a Hindu Muslim group of uh, entrepreneurs really keen to get on with enterprise and make their lives as they do and become extremely rich eventually from uh, investments, starting off with a single sewing machine, ending up in Uganda as owners of the greatest textile mills in East Africa. So it was that kind of enterprise that marked the, the migrations and travel on the east coast of Africa. We can go on breaking down and differentiating, but I, I just wanted to signal that because that is where we are in thinking beyond the miserablest narrative that David reminds us is not the only way of understanding what happened, and, and as I put it, it's oblivion and opportunity that we need to bear in mind. So how would the museum actually come to reflect on the experience of the indentured diaspora? You see, on the one hand, I see the museum as a, class, a museum full of the greatest classical art of the world, if we look just simply even at this image of the 
Didarganj Yakshi figure carrying, is she carrying a conch shell? Is she carrying a fly whisk? Is she carrying a lotus? This has been subject of argument throughout the history of art, just this figure and how to interpret it, as I say. In the same way, how is the indentured experience to be included in the museum, if at all? You said something like a space for the diasporic experience is being set aside. And that follows the pattern that a classical museum was pressed eventually to include folkloric art and folk art then enters the museum. As we have further struggles from the excluded and the minorities, space one imagines is being created for the creativity and the artwork of the scheduled casts, of the OBEs, the other backward casts, the, these awful uh, categories begin to remind us of the apartheid system and the refined categorization of people, ethnic groups, subdivisions, and so on. We can imagine that, in fact, there will soon be pressure to have the art of the Dalits, that this category of recent construction would present uh, uh, an issue for the museum and that this would have to be included. So is this what one would imagine would happen with the indentured diaspora, that somehow a little space will be created somewhere, a few vitrines and a few shelves, and of course, objects gathered from the uh, diasporic world brought on and, and placed in Bihar. And I think that would be a disaster. And that would be um, really failing to take on board these shifts in the paradigms through which we think migration and indentureship that Francois so, so beautifully uh, presented as the shift away from thinking in terms of land and, and territory, but thinking of the new territorialization of the oceans and the sea and this fluidity that is always overshooting any border or any boundary we place on it. And so the model, I would say the analytical model can't be the one given to us by classic uh, post-colonial theory of the center and the periphery. And that the periphery is then simply brought to the center of Bihar. It's not that at all. It will have to be something like a feedback loop, a model based on the feedback. On, on the constant transformation of one point when elements from the other point are taken into account. And this dynamic, mutually transformative kind of relationship is what I think we would want to explore more carefully in thinking what we mean by the connections between Bihar and the world and particularly the indentured diaspora, all the, all the uh, stories of transformation in the diaspora is, uh, are, are deeply striking and arresting and which will require uh, our, our analysis more carefully. And I just want to sum that up through one incident only. And that is that once Gandhi returns from South Africa, and we tend to forget that he stayed in South Africa for 21 years, that it wasn't a brief passing through as a lawyer who changed his clothes and then took the ship back to India. It is a 21 year experiment, a deep transformation on the empirical level through an encounter with the Biharis, with the Bhaiyas, as he, he himself took on this name. He said the most endearing name, the most affectionate name that I ever had was Bhaiya. Of course, he will come to Bihar and he will become Bapu. He will then go on for the whole of India to become the Mahatma. So these transformations of Gandhi's identity itself 
uh, a revealing of the connection between and the importance of the experience of the indenture in the shaping of, as Clifford rightly points out, of the whole uh, technology of Satyagraha or the whole philosophy of Satyagraha, the gravity of truth, the gravitational pull of truth to translate from Sanskrit quite literally, the gravitational pull of truth, how would this impel action? So when Gandhi arrives from South Africa in 1915, one of his first informants tells him about the terrible state of uh, the farmers in Bihar, especially in the Northeast of Bihar, in Purbi Champaran, and in Champaran, the British planters have begun to force the farmers to devote a part of the land to the planting of indigo, or as it was called, meal. Meal meaning blue, but it was just referred to as blue. And the farmers were, for a period, uh, before the First World War, up to the First World War, there was a great demand for indigo. Then the Germans invented a dye which meant that you got a cheaper version of blue, which could be used. It repeats the history of the 17th century when the Dutch managed to crack the code of how to get a red madder to fix, which they took from Kerala and from the Malabar coast. The same uh, change in technology or cracking the code of the dyes, this transference of indigenous knowledge into Western industrial production. And, and then Gandhi uh, sees that, in fact, what is happening is a further intensification of the change in the land laws. So one of the, uh, one of the pressures behind the acceptance of going into uh, into the indenture contract was the fact that land was increasingly being taken over by the British. First, they were, it was a declining uh, plantation, indigo, but then secondly, once the, the war was, uh, the war with Germany began, once again, indigo planting had to begin. And so we see um, in this little, event. I think Gandhi is met at Patna station in Bihar by Rajkumar Shukla, Pandit Rajkumar Shukla, who takes him to uh, Champaran. Of course, north of Champaran into Uttar Pradesh is the area called Maharaj Ganj. And from Maharaj Ganj is where the word Maharaj goes into the diaspora. And that is where my own grandfather from Barabanki at Lucknow University leaves to escape whatever he escaped into, into the um, indenture. This whole period of the first indentureship is called, uh, at least it's called the first contract or the first, uh, first agreement, which was translated into uh, Hindi as the Pehla Girmitya. The Pehla Girmitya is the scene of this first encounter with the other. And therefore I want to say that um, I want to close with, with the um, image, with, uh, with, with the, the words with which I should have opened, eating with which I should have opened. The language of Bihar passing into the um, diaspora. The greeting is pranam and pai lagi. Uh, may I, I touch thy feet. To which I want to add the word salam, showing to, to what extent the multiplicity of languages and religions mattered here. Vanakam from the south, and the cross, and of course, who received them? The Isi Zulu who received the indentured had their own welcome for them. 
and that's in the word saubona, which is very similar to the word namaste, which is the modern Indian Sanskrit form of greeting. So maybe with those ideas, I should stop here. They all need development, so forgive me if they're a bit telegraphic and, and curtailed, but I'm trying to suggest that we have a field of study, we have a field of research, which I hope very much all of us gathered here, Francois, Clifford, David, and of course our wonderful Alka, animator of all these events, we might be able to pursue and press on and introduce as a dimension of uh, thinking about art, culture, and identity in India today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarat. Thank you, really, all of you, uh, Francoise, Clifford, and David, for bringing together uh, different journeys into the main meta-narrative of the indentured. Um, after the very poetic conclusion of Gandhi's movement from South Africa to India and the many ways of saying Namaste, Salam and addressing each other in a multiplicity or multivocality of India. I just think that we have time left only for one question now, which I would just like to, maybe all of you can answer it, that where do you think we are today with the indentured, particularly a large part of the indentured, which is gone into different parts of the world. And what I take from this definitely is that there has to be a rethinking, a reimagining, and a relooking at the journey of the indentured. We can't think of it only as one of pain and conflict. And as all of you have mentioned that there are renegotiations, remappings, and also a certain kind of, you know, not just conflict, but some kind of gains and some kind of enrich enrichment, which has happened. And as David uh, said right in the beginning, the complete eraser of caste, which can be very problematic and which is very problematic within the subcontinent. So would anybody like to carry on with the... <clears throat> Alka, if I may. Yes. Wonderful to listen to Sarah. I can do that all day. Then, Clifford and Francois, and to, for us to make this connection, I go away from this with something that Clifford said, which I hope I could he could email me with the exact quotation, because ink contains a residue of the memory of water. I mean, isn't that bloody poetic? That's worth waking up in the morning just to listen to, right? I will always take that away from me. But I just end very briefly with a quotation from Dr. Um, Kumar again on caste, because I think this is something that still plagues us in India. He said um, wh when people were um, um, recruiting, being recruited, he said high castes often self-reported as lower caste. People of high caste were not allowed to enroll as coolies, were not allowed to enroll as coolies. So many Brahmins and other high castes became indentured changing their caste. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. That's part of the fluidity that's a paradox of anarchy that Clifford mentions and Sarah mentions, and of course, Francois. Imagine that you needed the food and you needed the work and you, you had the promise of land at the end of it, right? Let me just end by saying what I can say to Bihar, if I may. One of your richest resources are outside of Bihar, the Aslot in the Caribbean, in South Africa, in Reunion, and in Fiji, and elsewhere, right, Mauritius. The best they connect up with us, especially now, practically, we have a lot of money. 
not just imaginative resources, but material resources that tap into it. I'll, I'll be happy to, to assist in this um in this new system of a uh, of a uh, robbery, as it were. Hmm. Well, thank you, David. I don't know where Alka might be, uh, but. Uh, all of you have made such fantastic points, and of course, I'm sure the image of um, Clifford's curry leaf plant will be seared in our minds as a, as a symbol of um, many of the ideas and that fantastic moving skirt archive that Francois talked about, the seeds stitched into the hems of skirts and dresses. And, uh, and, and defiance of colonial authority and the transport or transference of seeds from one, one place to the other. I think all of that is, uh, is fantastically visual in, and I'm, I'm glad that the visual comes in in this uh, way. Uh, Alka, I can see an image of you. Are you trying mm -hmm. to say something? I, I simply jumped in because I thought you might have gone to do something. I think she's trying to connect with her iPhone. Oh, yes, I've connected. Yeah. Thank so, you. Yeah. I, I, could I just quickly sneak, sneak in a little short story? Uh, sorry, sorry. Hello. Oh, hi, sorry. Uh, no, just oh, about uh, uh, your, the question you raised and, and the remark. Uh, I think one of the things we can show today is constantly the unexpected and the unforeseen. I mean, what escaped the plan of colonialism, right? I mean, they want to transport people and so to work and replace the enslaved and it does not work all according to their plan. I mean, uh, one of the things, for instance, for the French power, everyone coming from India was Hindu, right? So, but they were some Muslim. And in Réunion, some of the temple, because they were allowed to have temple on the plantation, you will find a place for the Muslim within. You know, we have the place for the ritual and a place for the other. So this kind of unexpected way, I think is very important even today. So that brought up the story also of escaping suffering, of escaping just domination. Yeah, one second. I have to put that there are these processes. And, uh, and the other things I, I will say also, I absolutely agree that there cannot be a room for the endanger because it first it put them in the past, whereas there is still, what can we say? I mean, how can this answer it uh, today? The form of endangership, both that escape and both that still, you know, are the form of domination. Constantly this constant movement and the, the, the personal history, the individual, um, how, for instance, even migrants today around in Europe don't see themselves as victims but even as the travelers of the 21st century, overcoming, having total audacity, courage, overcoming incredible obstacles. They see themselves, you know, this is the odyssey of the 21st century for them. And this does not to undermine the suffering, the torture, everything else, but also to escape from the narrative of suffering that always bring back also the white, the white savior, the person who will come to save you from that suffering. So perhaps it's also to turn around the question of suffering and, and just more, you know, the question of exploitation that bring, of course, suffering, but no, but out of the Western uh, understanding of suffering uh, that uh, required the savior and the savior will be the same person what put you in that okay. system. So that we save ourselves. I mean, that would be that. And uh, the connection with the word, I think this is the key. It was yesterday and it's today. It's really also today. And so it has to transpire all through the museum. That is a constant connection that is being reworked and reestablished and seen differently. Uh, you know, the connection there we're seeing in, I don't know, in 1870 from today. And I would say the question of language is very important because uh, quite often we do think that people lose their language when they arrive in the colony. And uh, studies by uh, linguists and historians have shown that they keep so that, but they will keep that language for themselves outside of the public sphere. So I would say there are different level 
of, of intervening. And that is not a parallel story to the colonial story, but in an history in itself and by itself and for itself. Exactly. Can I just quickly come in with a short, a little short story? Um, uh, pedagogy has been really an important dynamic dynamic in terms of our experience in South Africa, especially during the struggle, to really challenge the the educational system, the indoctrination that a system was a social system, a social architecture that was placed on on people. So it's something that I think um, the Bihar Museum would, uh, allows itself for the new possibility. Because I think just to take a phrase from the director of the London School of Economics, she talked about a, a new paradigm shift in a sense where it was more about a new social contract. How do we start changing things? Because today the argument with a recent study by the uh, World Economic Forum, in, I think in 2018, just before the, the um, pandemic said that it takes at least, if you poor in the UK, it takes you about five generations to move up to middle class. If you were poor in South Africa, it takes you nine generations, America five, maybe Denmark too. So there's a, there's a new shift in terms of how we approach education, how we develop a way of engaging with people, you know, the talking heads, sim symbols, it's a shift. And just coming back to language that Francois talked about, my, one of my ancestors uh, was sent, because she was a woman born in South Africa, she was sent back to India and she lived in India. And then many years later, an uncle of mine was studying medicine, went to visit her. He found her and um, it appeared that his father was sending money, that was my great grandfather, sending money to India to build a house according to this plan that they had sent. And he spoke to her in Zulu because he didn't want the rest of the villagers to know what was actually happening, to discover that, of course, the money had, had disappeared. <laughs> so it was just interesting in terms of how language goes the other way around. But I yeah. want to come back to uh, the museum and, and, uh, and, the, and the caution around not identifying, uh, while indenture is an important rupture or a social wound, um, like David said, it's not the whole story. It's part of the story. The body still carries that mark, but it's how do we keep, or how do we respect the body uh, and still remember the scar? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think um, we have got lots to think about, lots to ponder, and lots to reimagine from the space of the museum, the journey of the indentured, the relooking, and the remapping. So I'd like to thank all of you, Clifford. David, Francois, and Sarath for this very, very thoughtful and insightful panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Francois, Clifford, David, and let's hope we meet when the whole viral cloud lifts. <laughs> we look forward to the physical meeting and saying hello to each other in our different languages. Thank you. <laughs>